right, everybody. I am super duper excited here. Um, I have the one and the only Pedro <laughs> Ustash here who For better or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> no, for better, for better. Oh my god. Um I met Pedro uh -huh. what was this? This was before COVID, right? Because Are you Ramon, serious? I think so. Ramon Manas had had introduced us. Ramon Manas from Travel Sack. Of course. Too. Yes. That's, so, oh my gosh, I didn't remember that. Of course. Yeah. So that was, I think that was right before. That was the last Nam before COVID. Um, God, it's like every everything's gauged by COVID. But yeah. anyway, we met, and then that was awesome. We met at the Legere. Uh, we met at the Legere. That's true. Of course, I remember that. Now I do. Of course, of course. Yeah. Was so, night with you. I hope I was not ugly. Oh, no, you were awesome. You were awesome. You can't say now. I'm just like. Ah. You know, sometimes I'm a little bit intense. You no, know, it's crazy. And and I'm going to correct myself. I think it was either right before COVID or it was it. Um, I'm pretty sure it was then or it could have been the time with Legere where um, they were sponsoring me. And it was uh, either in June or something like that. It was one of, yeah. maybe one of the smaller no, one of those one of those things. I remember now they all blend. They all blend together. Yeah, that's true. You know? That's true. That's true. NAM is so uh, NAM stands for National Association of Music Merchants. By the way, if you're not aware, and most people know, when I go to NAM, um, I interview as many people as I possibly can without passing out because it is a very tiring yeah. thing. People don't realize, yeah. but um, it was so great to meet you. You know, Ramon had introduced I us. I was so taken aback about how many instruments you know. But what I want to do for those people that may not know you i want them to get like a background on you in terms on of like you know where you grew up how you got started in music and you know i'm gonna have some questions about that for sure um mm -hmm. because there's some definitely interesting things there but yeah let's start off that way where did you grow up when did you get started with music and what was your what was your first instrument that you played how much time we got because a long question <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the show <laughs> People, go get your coffee. Sit down. <laughs> we were joking before about my my New York accent. It's going to come out. <laughs> Absolutely, and I and I discovered America through New York, so we can talk to each other real good. That's right. Oh, uh, call me. We'll talk. Anyways, uh, Donna, this is great. Thank you, number one, uh, for the wonderful opportunity to do this thing. Thank you uh, for being here. Especially, especially, I want to put something on the on the on the on the on the from the onset. I don't even know if I qualify to be in this thing because uh, I am not seen or I do not act as a specialist only in the saxophone. I do many other things, but uh, the saxophones are extremely important and instrumental and uh, indelible part of my music endeavor. So I'm very honored. And it may be what I thought when you asked me to be interviewed for this. I said, man, some people might think I'm not qualified because I'm not a, you know, a dedicated saxophonist only and a specialist. Maybe that might be a positive thing to give another completely different take of somebody coming from a completely different angle and dealing and discovering the instrument and dealing with it from a very unusual perspective. So I said, um, oh, then I'm cool that I can share. So that's why I'm, I'm confident of uh, and honored again. To, to be able to, hopefully I will not let you down and not let down the people listening to this. Um, Donna, I was born and raised in Caracas, Venezuela. And as I shared a little bit before we started recording, um, my parents, this is really interesting multicultural experience that I think that then it uh, trickled into my music making. Uh, it's a DNA and uh environmental kind of thing is, is double uh my parents my dad was black my mom was white so that's why i'm chocolatico <laughs> like label label m the singer the star of uh lion king uh he's with good good buddies and we tour one night and we record together and whatnot so no 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 pedro you say you cappuccino better cappuccino don't say cafe ole you cappuccino oh that's funny so anyways i receive DNA wise, blessings from both the white and the black side. Okay. Um, parents came from Haiti, uh, which we know is going through turmoil uh, nowadays. Yeah. Uh, and it's been for many years. That's why my parents immigrated uh, to Venezuela. But again, 
the only people in, in their families, in our families that went to a Hispanic country was them, was a couple of my mom and dad. Everybody else went to New York and to Montreal, Canada, and they don't even speak Spanish. So we're kind of weird in that sense. So is not only I come from a double genetic uh, uh, mixture thing, which is incredibly enriching to me, because I believe I'm the recipient of the experience of my ancestors. Ancestors, I, I, I think I'm, I'm I'm very blessed by that, and, and I feel it many times in the music, and um, and the same thing of having been brought up on the context of Haitian thought and culture and idiosyncrasy inside a completely different reality, which is the Venezuelan reality. So that's something that gave me flexibility since my birth, literally. Uh, <clears throat> I grew up there in a very uh, devout uh, Baptist evangelical uh, uh, family, which I'm very proud of. Not because of the religious side, but because my parents got me in through Jesus and Jesus is my life. And we can talk about that later. Again, clarifying that I'm not into selling ideology or trying to insult people by manipulating their intellect. Not at all. I don't like when people do that with me. Uh, I just need to speak my, my reality as an artist. And uh, the, it, call, it all comes from there. My elder brother, we're seven. I'm number six. And my elder brother, Michel Maestro, since I was very little, introduced me to many kinds of his many kinds of music. His perspective is a genius thing. That his vision, which he said he received from one of our uncles, was this open thing. That since I was three or four, he introduced me to so many different kinds of music to a super high level that I call him my maestro to this day. And I believe I'm reaping incredible blessings and consequences from the seed that he planted since I was three or four. And he exposed me. We grew up in church, so we grew up singing the beautiful traditional hymns that now in church, they're not even sung anymore. I mean, that's lost art. You know, I know this thing's my heart now. You know, greatest like faithfulness and, and in the garden and things like that. Uh, 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 obviously, everybody knows amazing grace, but there's so many other things, very powerful, very powerful musical expression that doesn't exist anymore. I grew up in that, but he introduced me to Peter and the Wolf, Prokofiev. You know, he introduced me to an orchestral guide to youth of Benjamin Britten. You know, since I'm four. And you're, you're a kid, there's no internet, there's no computers, there's none of this stuff, there's no YouTube, none of this stuff. And you're in the dark, because we have four in, in, a, in a room, you know, it's like, <laughs> my parents were not, we're not rich. So we're like three or four in this room, and he puts the things, and it's all dark, and I'm listening to these things. And I'm listening to Lorin Mazel introducing with the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra, uh, uh, Peter and the Wolf, the person. And you, as a kid, you start imagining things. Then... He puts me in South American things with Kena and 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 in Charango. Then he puts me with Renaissance and medieval uh, 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 music, and you go like, what the heck? Early music, and because he then he had an institute, he had an association called the uh, Johann Sebastian Bach Music Association, which was comprised of three things: a choir. Grupo Vocal is a vocal uh, 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 ensemble. It was uh, Estudiantina, which is a plucked uh, uh, string instrument uh, thing. So it's guitars, mandolins. We play the cuatro, which is the national little national guitar of Venezuela. Man, we can party with that thing just with four little strings. <laughs> we, can, oh, wow. we can party so bad. <laughs> it's just a cuatro. We can, oh my gosh, from here to the moon. And, and like that. And he had a recorder quintet. So Donna, my, he introduced me to all these things. So I'm listening. And when you are a young soul and you're inquisitive and you're curious, your mind, your soul, your heart picks all these things. And you are like... <gasps> In my heart, it felt like different dishes, you know, like different, it's like, wow, different tastes, different things. And 
It makes so much sense. Now, look what I'm doing. Isn't that amazing? So he started teaching me the recorder when I was nine. When I experienced blowing into this thing and with the, with the recorded quintet, sometimes it was a quartet, I experienced polyphony. <sighs> then I said, this is what I want to do with my life. I was nine mm. when I said this. <clears throat> I experienced a funny thing. I realized that was exactly the same age. I realized I want Jesus in my heart. I was so my spiritual, my spiritual walk and my music walk <laughs> yep. right together. I just realized that that's scary. Whoa. Amazing. Anyways, anyways, yeah. not that I just realized. I remember that because I've realized this before. Anyways, the thing is, by virtue of all these things, and he's fantastic flautist, and he conducts choirs, and, and he was this multidisciplinary, I think, because he graduated as a, a physical educator. Uh, from 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 the university so but he had this kind of you know super multi-directional vision you know he's a visionary and he impacted me with that so for me that's normal you see to, to be able to and we speak haitian creole and then we have the the the, the meals that came from the culture of my parents but then we go out and we have uh empanadas we have arepas and, you know, my wife makes the best arepas in the whole history of humanity, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I grew up in this incredibly rich, nurturing, challenging, but empowering reality, which is the cauldron of Latin America, of Venezuela. We, back then, I don't know now, because I've been out of there for more than 34 years, and in a few days, we're going to celebrate 35 years of being in this challenged but incredibly blessed country we call the United States. Very proud, very blessed to be here. Yeah. No politics, no nothing, just my reality as a human being. Yeah. I'm incredibly blessed to be here and very appreciative and very, very uh, 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 thankful, really, to, to, to the creator and to this country for the blessings that that i have received from 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 being here and my mentors are one night whether we can talk later about long story short uh with all these things i grew up like this and in the, all this plurality due to my brother's thing he wanted me to play the violin and i hated it with all my heart <laughs> i had great sound but my intonation sucked so bad that I said, I can do this, otherwise I'm going to commit suicide. That's <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> all I'm listening. You can't do this. He said, okay. He was so smart. Donna, check this out. He said, okay, you're not going to play that because you don't like it, but you're going to choose something to play because you're good for this and I'm going to let you off the hook. Smart, you see. He didn't force me, but he said, you need to do this. You're good for this. Then... Oh, by the way, I remember we did our first recording. I set foot in a professional studio when I was 12, Donna. Oh, wow. This is, embarrassingly enough, 52 years ago. <laughs> Do the math. <laughs> <laughs> so about almost, almost 52 years ago. 51, almost a few days. Uh, yeah. So, and I remember how it felt. I'd felt weird, but I felt comfortable. Mm. I said, whoa. So look where I am now. Yeah. So it was an amazing thing. And something important I need to say, maybe this will bless somebody. Um, I I didn't enjoy performing in front of people in the beginning. Oh. I, 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 as exuberant as I might look now, that's something I develop. That's something I learned to do because I needed to work as a, as a performer. My nature was I really could not deal with people criticizing me or me making a mistake in front of people. It was too embarrassing for me. I did enjoy the experience of expressing through the instrument what I felt. So maybe there are people dealing with that, that, you know, they don't feel comfortable because, but the experience is ah, that going vertical, like I call it, you know, when you pick up a horn. And now, 
But the one I, I believe the, the big one from above has blessed me with the joy to be able to exercise that now in front of people. Yeah. He got to a place that now I can exercise that. Playing classical music was very difficult to do that for me because of the aspect of what Glenn Gould will call the people come to the concerts only to hear the maestro make mistakes. <clears throat> I remember when I had my debut and I'm jumping. The first time as a soloist was in the Teatro Real de Madrid in the Royal Theater of Madrid. A few months before I got married in 1980. You were not born, I think. <laughs> no, no, I was. <laughs> Thank you, though. Anyway, I can, can be your father. I know that. I know I can be your dad. Anyways, <laughs> but, uh, time was, uh, biologically speaking, but my point is, I remember people coming in Spain with the music score in miniature, checking out everything I was doing while I was performing. Wow. Wow. That is so anti-music. Yeah. And for many years, I struggled with that. And I left classical music, but now return. And I can talk about that later because I think it's important to talk about this. It is. Um, but, and I jump, I go back. Then how did I pick up the flute? My brother played the flute for me. It was extremely boring what we did because he was doing classical music. And for me, you know, teenagers, I was 13, 14, something like that. And so I, I cannot connect with that. But then, Donna, I heard, I talked to the wind, which is the song by King Crimson in a, a record called In the Court of King, of King Crimson. I talked to the wind. And the guy's a doubler because he plays saxophone too. I don't know if he's alive still. I, maybe he is. And he might be in New York. Maybe you should check him out. Oh. Yeah, it's uh, King Crimson's uh, sax player. I'm, I'm embarrassed. I don't remember his name. But he doubles in flute. And, of course, he's not, you know, a symphonic flute player or whatnot. But the music he made in this rock ballad medium thing. Oh, I freaked out. Being a kid, I went like, oh, my gosh. So you mean with, with the instrument, my brother plays those things that I consider boring. You can do rock and roll. I want to play the flute. That's how I got into the flute. Got it. Got it. So he got me a flute. He started teaching me. I went to school, to two conservatories there. Then Maestro Jose Antonio Abreu came out with El Sistema. Yeah, I was going to ask so you about I that. am a member, founder, literally, of this movement, where Dudamel is like third generation of, by, I come from El Sistema. Uh, by the time they came, things were established. When we did our thing, I, tell, I tell them, to, to the kids, to the youngsters now, I said, you guys now got freeways, four lanes, freeways, six lanes, freeways. When we started, we went into the jungle, opening up the ways for you guys with machetes and whatnot. Donna, we did incredible things. We did tours in South America in military, not well kept planes. So much so that one of them, after we did our thing, they went to take a choir from the UCV uh, Universidad Central de Venezuela, the Central University of Venezuela, the, their choir, and they got in a storm and they all perished. The, that plane that we rode came down in the Azores island in front of Portugal. Uh, that crazy these things were. I mean, we were, we're in these planes and we could see the, it's things were parachutists, you know, but we could literally see the cables dangling on top of us. And there's so many stories, but Maestro Abreu had this vision. This almost Leonardo-like vision, you know, this, that you can see the result now. You know, this thing ended up 700,000 kids playing instruments, and you have Dudamel, you have so many other conductors in the world, and you have this big names, you know, all over the, the musical culture. This guy was a super genius. So I got into this. Well, can you, then, can you tell people, um, they may not be aware of what, what El Sistema is. El, great, thank you. El Sistema is a movement that this genius, Dr. Jose Antonio Abreu, super genius, that he did something impossible to do in a first world, first order country on a third world country. Imagine that. I mean, he got away with the impossible. He survived different regimes from one extreme to the other. Through 40 years, he stood there steadfastly. And his thing was to empower kids to make music. It became 
uh, cradle for symphonic music. So since I'm a teenager, I'm playing Tchaikovsky, I'm playing Beethoven, I'm playing Mozart, I'm playing all these things. This is ingrained in me. We toured South America again. We toured in Europe with this thing. That's why you can see now, if you go and you see, if you look for El Sistema Venezuela and you Google Children's Orchestra, make sure you take a volume or something first because people are going to freak out. When you see a kid playing a violin and she's nine and she plays like a 60 year old veteran, you freak out. When you see a little kid who's eight that has to stand up on a chair because the trombone is so big, the only way he can do that is standing on a chair. <laughs> you freak out. It's something extraordinary. And it's the now it's like four or five generations. I'm, I'm part of the first one, the founders, the members. Uh, then there's another generation of like my students and then there's the students of my students, which is the Dudamel generation. And then there's a fourth and a fifth generation. And many of uh, uh, Dudamel's was regarded as probably the strongest young conductor in the world is L.A. Phil's conductor. Uh, it was of the Paris Opera for a few months. Now it's going to be the main New York Philharmonic conductor in two or three years from now. And like that, and he's been conducting. He's a superstar, you know. Uh, we've done things together. You can Google us, and you can see that in YouTube. Um, although now we're not very close because you know our lives go to different directions and whatnot. And I'm talking too much. But the thing is, thanks to this, to the vision of Doctor Abreu, I finished and I became the first official piccolo. Uh, and this is amazing, uh, uh, Donna. You're gonna love this. When I was little, I mentioned that I listened to uh, Benjamin Britten's orchestral guide for youth he presents all the instruments and all the families and whatnot and at the end when he puts them together he wrote this super master piece which is a fugue that starts with the piccolo like that i listened to this when i was since i was four I come into the orchestra playing the piccolo, and one of the first things I play is freaking Benjamin. <laughs> it's like, wow, wow. Amazing. Yeah. Powerful. So we discovered Europe. We discovered the huge level they had when we, he brought us to. So then after I finished my studies there, he made sure I got a scholarship from the Venezuelan government, and we went to Paris, and I studied there for more than three years. We got married, Sarah, my wife and I, and we went there and she studied music education, graduated in that. And I studied flute and I graduated in that in two conservatories. And I went to do master of things uh, afterwards in, in private uh, with a huge master, Oral Nicole. Madonna, I had the privilege to study with four of the major, most major flute teachers ever in, in France. Uh, Raymond Guillaume, Alain Marion first. And then there's Pierre Varto, who I just talked like a month ago with, and uh, and Aurel Nicolet, who's not with us anymore. Alain Marion and Aurel Nicolet are not with us anymore. But flute players or sax players that double need to check these people out. Those names are huge. I can write them for you later. Yes, to please. Spelling uh, it, because we don't we don't have this anymore. So my wife and I have ears and things that you know is is. Uh, do, does not exist anymore and i think there would be great incredible reference to sax players i want to double and want to have really good references in flute for example um it's just an era gun and 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 yeah my point is that's where i discovered jazz in a very very high level because again since my youth my brother was so open he put super almost cheesy like jazz things not cheese. I don't want to insult people, but like, what is Paul Horn, for example, who's a great sax player, but he did some albums like they were like almost like happy jazz. Although again, he could really play. I mean, you, you do Google and Paul Horn, he can navigate the changes like nobody's business. Really good. <clears throat> but then you go all the way to not only Duke Ellington and, and, and Bird and, 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 and Coltrane, but you go to Eric Dolphy. So I remember being very young and looking at Dolphy's out to lunch thing. <laughs> and the other one where Dolphy's sitting down on the picture 
and he's got the flute and he's trying to do some and the alto sax is here and the bass clarinet is here and just the visuals i'm going i could not understand squat of the music it was too much for me because i'm a kid but i was so impressed by the level of truth that i not only heard in that music that i did not understand but affected me and in just the picture depicted a truth from eric dolphy that i was so taken by him that i picked up the bass clarinet before i got into the saxophone that crazy it was okay so i went for all the flute stuff <clears throat> I level graduated in Europe with the greatest teachers. I come with my diplomas, my thanks. I become first flute of the Simon Bolivar Symphony Orchestra. And I said two things. I need to play. Because, uh, when, before going to Europe, I picked up an alto. And I remember it destroyed my sound as a flute player. Mm. It destroyed my ambition. And I had a beautiful sound in sax. But I said, no, 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 no. Let me get established a flute first. So I left the saxophone for 10 years, Donna. Wow. And concentrated on the flute. Once I was set, I heard people like a colleague, I haven't seen him in a long time, Jorge Guzman from Chile. He played sax. I said, hmm, Jorge had a great sound in flute and, and he's not damaged. And then, of course, I, I heard about uh, uh, Steve Kujala when he was playing with, uh, with, uh, with Chick. He played both flute and saxophone. He played beautifully saxophone. I said, Kujala, Steve, I mean, who is now found out, of course, that he was the son of Wally Kujala, who was the pickle of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. But Steve is this genius. He's a, he's a studio guy. He, he, he works, he's part of the Hollywood uh, 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 Orchestra. Uh, and he's great solace and great musician and incredible studio musician as well. And great friend, wonderful friend. And, but I saw that they could play. So that's why after many years, hmm, let me try. And that's when I got back again on the saxophone, uh, you know, and I went and took some lessons with great masters in Venezuela, Ramon Carranza, Moncho Carranza. And after with uh, super master Andres Briseño, who's now in New York for many, many years now, for more than 30 years uh, in New York, fantastic players. By the way, some of them were the ones that affected me in such a way. I jumped things. Let me go back to Europe. I discovered jazz to another level, European jazz. That's why I discovered world music. Paris is, an, is, is a volcanic explosion in that, you know. Mm -hmm. There are some neighborhoods in Paris like Barbès, Rochechoir, where people, you don't hear French in the streets, you know. You hear Arabic. Or you hear in some other neighborhoods of Barbès, you hear, you know, some Malinke or... or or some Zulu thing, you know, it's that world is Paris. It's, it's incredibly, and they have things that you don't have anymore. Now, of course, they have things we didn't have then, but they have things that this Tuesday night concert at the uh, La Maison de la Radio, uh, Radio France, uh, they have this incredible thing. And I will record every Tuesday night the concerts in cassettes. And I discovered the jazz world of the French, and I discovered all the musicians, and they were incredible. I went like, by, but by touring with the symphony orchestra earlier than that, before going to France, I had friends that were into jazz, so they got me into Miles, and they got me into so many of, and it was at the time of fusion, you know, jazz fusion. They were like, I dig this, so I got into Miles on the corner, things like that. <laughs> okay. And I realized that there were these weird sounds with Tampura in the back. And I remember, man, I was attracted to Ravi Shankar's sounds because my brother, again, was into all these things. Long story short, Donna, by virtue of all this stuff, I got exposed to this. I started literally studying Shakuhachi back then. I started studying Balafon because I needed an outlet to survive the absurd strictness of classical Western music. I was, I was playing my flute for eight hours a day for months on end because I felt I was behind. You see, I started a little bit uh, late and in order to keep up, I, I had to do that. And my neighbors hated me, but I had to practice. And, um, but then I discovered Indian music. I discovered African music. I discovered Arabic music. I discovered 
Japanese music. So I started doing all these things. I, I started studying uh, uh, Tam Tam, which is a talking drum as well. And uh, in the music, I even had a sitar, started studying sitar and everything. It was my way to... Because it was too intense, you know, the, the level of how strict our training was in the conservatory and the classical music. It was every Friday we meet in a group, you know, we were 12 of us, and it was dog eat dog. We didn't know what the teacher was going to ask us. Wow. We have to go, and whatever he asks, you have to not embarrass yourself and be prepared and shine, and he will work on that. But you're dancing basically naked in front of everybody. And that was obviously also we had private lessons with the teachers and whatnot. But this made me toughen up. But then again, it's when I said, oh, man, I wish I could come to the saxophone back, you know. Yeah, but let me ask you something, because uh -huh. before you said with regard to like performance anxiety and all that kind of thing. And, you know, you you spiritually you were you were enjoying music. You know, it was your soul. But the thing that was almost sucked out of you was the fact you were afraid to make a mistake. You know, yeah. and that's that's almost sucked the yeah. joy out of you. And, and to and to be judged by that and, be and, to, be by that. and to be embarrassed by that. Yeah. Now, so there's, the, a, now there's a miracle. I, I changed. God changed my heart. How did you, but how, okay, so I want you to talk about how that transition happened because a lot, there's a lot of people that. It's a great question. Great yeah. question. Keep going. I interrupted you. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people, they, they want to pursue music and maybe later in life or whatever, you know, they had it when they were young and then they worked and they had kids and they're pursuing music now. But, you know, they're so afraid to make a mistake or they're so afraid um, to. To sometimes be judged. perform, to be, it's being judged, yeah, but it's also, a lot of times the being judged is also up here in your own mind. Yeah. yeah that's the other well, that, 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 That's part of it. Donna, I think we have both extremes now. We also have the people that have no concept that they're embarrassing themselves and insulting themselves and insulting the music by what they're doing it and they publicize it too. We have the two extremes. And I don't connect with either of those. There are people that are not aware how bad they are but they think they think they're legends in their own minds, and that's embarrassing to me. I see. That's okay. another extreme, and and we can see them. We can see them through 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 uh, social media. The same way we can see geniuses in social media, incredible super young guys who are geniuses. You, you know, mm -hmm. I've seen both extremes. But referring to this, that's a great question. For me, it was years. I had to consciously work spiritually at this and battle with this. And come to a realization that this is so precious. I believe I'm going to call from the almighty creator of the universe. And I'm going to let my, I'm not going to let my stupidity get in the way of that. Another thing I did is I left classical music for almost 30 years. By virtue of that. Wow. And getting into the studios and getting into jazz and getting into world music and getting into the popular music and getting into all these things, salsa and everything, the level of joy. But studio studio work is is high pressure, though. Yes, but it's different, Donna. After I did so much, let, let me tell this story. This is what happens, how I got to the studio. Can I jump? You're going to ask this probably later. And this is going to uh, help answer the question you asked this is a really interesting story and and this explains why i'm such a jesus freak you, you know really really it's not a religious thing it's a vertical life transformational reality that i have with the creator through the cross is i graduated from college i came to study with a genius no with a super genius dr james newton not james newton howard was my friend too and i've worked a lot of things the last thing we did was raya which is amazing amazing super genius film music composer i'm talking about james newton the flautist composer one of the hairs of the eric dolphin legacy okay he taught at california institute of the arts back then and i met him in europe while i was studying with all my teachers nicole and he was a great admirer of one of my teachers nicole and well, he's might have all my teachers, but especially Nicole. But Nicole, I admire him too. So it was this, you know, and he wanted to study with Nicole, but he never did. So when I wanted to come here to start with him at the California Institute of the Arts, 
after I'm doing all my classical things, first flute player in the Simon Bolivar Symphony Orchestra, then I become a normal uh, second flute in the in the Venezuela Symphony Orchestra, but I was many times first chair uh, uh, duties as well. I wanted to come study here because I didn't want to make, I got disenchanted with classical music for two reasons, by the way, real quick. I'm covering a lot of things here, Donna, but this is important. Number one, I was tired of not knowing what I was doing. Making music, wise, making music wise, I was doing what felt good. I was doing what my teachers taught me. I was doing what tradition said I had to do. Okay. I did not have any rhyme or reason to know musically why I had to do something. Huh. The depth and intention towards depth searching for the highest possible expression that could affect someone, including myself, into transcendence, was not there. One of our teachers, Maria Guinan, we're in a music analysis class. She says, in that measure 38, there's a crescendo. Give me a musical reason that justifies that crescendo. Don't tell me that is because it feels good, not because that's what tradition says, or not because that's what my teacher taught me to do. Give me a musical reason that would justify that crescendo. It took me 35 years to find an answer to that thing. And the answer is within musical phenomenology. We can talk about that later. It's incredible. Huh. The second thing why I left music was the lack of uh, classical music, Western classical music, was the lack of creativity. Donna, when once a year we do Duke Ellington specials and the one that ended there are being one of my teachers like that, and two of them, Ramon, both of them. They would be called to do the Ellington symphonic things. And they would do, you know, sea blues and things like that. And, and they would stand up and rip these solos. <clears throat> Maestro Moncho in alto and, and Andres Briseño in tenor. And I'm going like, we felt like cockroaches in that symphony orchestra. We're like, you say, what the heck am I doing? I want to do that. You know, so the lack of creativity is like they're playing the same thing, beautiful and everything. I mean, nothing against the great masters. I admire them to no end. I'm a Bach freak. And right after that, a Mozart freak. And after that, all the others, you know. Um, but the point is, I needed to be creative. And going in the studio back then, in Venezuela, I, might, I was probably the, the, the busiest studio flute player ever. I did all the movies, all the, uh, uh, the, the ads were very, very strong. Commercials are very strong part of that back then. It's not like secondary thing like here. It's like, you know, the top notch guys were doing commercials, you know. So you're treating commercials there, produce, producing wise or production wise, like they do movies here. You know, it's a very high level thing. And with genius composers, musicians. You know, Chuchito Sanoja and people like that. Uh, Alberto Naranjo, my mentors, you know, it's like uh, uh, Omar Ruiz was a genius, was here, a keyboardist and, and piano player and composer. Genius, genius, genius people. And I'm going like, I'm being creative here. Well, in the symphony orchestra, I'm like, I don't love the music, but I need it, I need it to breathe. So that's why I decided to leave that and come to, to America. Okay. They help us with a scholarship to come to the California Institute of the Arts because I wanted to study with, with James, James Newton. And he said, the only way I can help you come here, to try to find a scholarship to come here, is if we do an exchange, is if you teach me the things you learn from Nicola and the flute. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is wonderful. Long story short, uh, we had a terrible tragedy. Uh, Donna, our beautiful little daughter got sick with brain cancer. Oh my gosh. And she got, you know, and remission and everything and we come to america with the promise of science that she's recovered and she's gonna die of old age donna i don't want to make you cry or anybody but 26 days after we set foot in america she died in our arms here in valencia california oh wow so three sorry. years three years and nine months wow new country no support system oh yeah and this beautiful little girl gets called to heaven and you go like what is this? She, you live in the area. She's buried in, uh, in the 14th freeway. There is uh, Eternal Valley. There's a <clears throat> when this happens to you, Donna, everything is rattled in your life. 
long story short, I'm not trying to feel like a victim or to try to manipulate again for people to feel sorry for me. A human being could never, never inspire to be sorry. We are, we are beings created with worth built in. So we could never, never be considered to be like sorry of like victim. No. Uh, but what I'm going to say is very heavy. <clears throat> the level of pain from the incomprehension reality of this dynamic was such that we came this close to committing suicide. Wow. To jump in in San Pedro and Jesus showed up and saved our pots. Wow. And I owe him my life and I'm alive and I still smile having gone through this through us three years and nine months. And we have all the elements to have not wanting to live anymore. Yet here I am, you know, and we're going to celebrate 35 years of her passing. And I believe she's one of the strongest blessings I've received in my life. My wife is second one. And that's the second story. Uh, if I can recover from something like that, it's because it's something real and something I cannot argue against. Yeah. I'm a living example in my experience. I, we bite, we bit the bullet. We, I got my master's from Arts and everything. And James blessed me beautifully. And everybody, David Royce in my, please, you need, I need to tell you something about Paul Novros, my sax teacher there. He's amazing influence on me too. It's a beautiful thing because please, I hope we don't go only from stories, but I need, I need to share practical things in the saxophone like later, please. It's, it's important, please, please. Yeah. Especially coming from the side of a flute player. Maybe this, this might enrage somebody else. Um, uh, Maybe they know it already, but we, we, know, we never know. Maybe this may encourage somebody that doesn't play the saxophone, that is a good player, to try it. But who knows? You know, yeah. the more the merrier. The thing is, they all were incredible blessings. I graduate, but I'm doing these horrible gigs. Nothing bad with salsa and everything. You know, their great things went to Japan with Alex Acuna and the unknowns, but then they're far in between. You know, the other things with this not good gigs you know it's so difficult to live making music you know and donna my wife decided to go sell chicken at a place i'm not going to mention because they're not paying us to do publicity for them <laughs> and she's got stuck there for seven years selling fast food and i'm going like she's an educated graduated from an art school in paris selling chicken and we live in a mobile home in a park in Santa Clarita, New Hope, whatever. And I'm graduated with a master's degree in jazz from CalArts. I studied Indian music and I studied computer electronic music and, and, and computer programming and all these things to end up doing what I'm doing. And he got to a place in which I could not take it anymore, Donna. This story is almost like Cinderella or something. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, 95, January 95, my New Year's resolution was to give up music and go sell cars. Whoa. And I told my wife, Mommy, I'm sorry I'm not able to uh, to make it. And the way I, I, I you know, I, I come from this tradition that, you know, I need to provide for the house. Of course, you provide too, but, you know, I should be able to. And I don't think I'm doing that. And my wife was beautiful, you know, you can see her here. Yeah, beautiful picture, you know? yeah. Yeah. And she says, oh, that's, that's, I'm younger there. I'm, I'm older. That's not a good representation for her. <laughs> She's like another New Yorker, you know. She goes, you need to get an updated picture to see people see how I am now. Anyways, <laughs> for me, she's the same. Uh, she looked at me. She said, listen, I don't know what you're going to have to do. Because I went to her and said, mommy, I'm sorry I cannot provide the way. I don't care what they're going to say in Venezuela because they're thinking I'm a big thing there i'm gonna give up music and i'm gonna go sell cars her gag reaction was i don't know what you're gonna have to do if you're gonna have to spend more time in your knees praying she's also a believer in, in fact that saved our lives saved our marriage and saved our sanity jesus did because i don't know if people know that when you go through tragedy like that which don't it's not natural we're not supposed to bury our kids our kids are supposed to bury us yeah. you know this rattles the whole logic of whatever that God didn't let us down. He became so real to us. 
so strong reality that we are stronger than ever. She and I, we just celebrated 43 years of marriage, you know, back in June. She's amazing. While well, I was touring with fans, by the way, which is a weird thing. But anyways, she's 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 such a strong column for me. God bless her. I would not be where I am without my family, especially without my wife. Yeah. And and the support of my friends and the prayers and and, 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 and all that. And her response again was, I don't know what you're gonna have to do if you're gonna have to spend more time in your knees. But I sacrificed my part already. You're going to make it or you're going to make it. Nothing wrong with selling cars, but God did not create you. And you're good for this. So I'm not letting you do this. And I'm going like, see, mommy. You know? <laughs> you're, good for the, you're good for this again. Yes. Then three months later, exactly the same week my father died. Oh. Donna, we cannot make up this stuff. We cannot make this stuff up. I received a call from Hong Kong from Danny Reyes, the wonderful percussionist. That now is, what is that group? Uh, he was with Yanni back then. Uh, there is a, a, a Isaac something. There is a, a this singer of the uh, country. They played in the in the in the Fourth of July. Uh, he's very famous. I can I can tell you the name. He's now with them. It is wonderful, wonderful percussionist, and he comes from a whole legacy family from Walfredo de los Reyes and Wally Junior and. Kamar, who's an actor, and there's just a whole uh, incredible family of, of super duper incredible, strong, fantastic musician artists, guys, legendary. And he calls me from Hong Kong, Pedro, Yanni, you know, that great guy with a big orchestra yeah. thing, he's looking for a new flute player. Would you like to come and join us? The same week my father died. And I told him, listen, I'm dealing with this. Of course, I'd love to. And when they came, in my audition for Yanni, Donna, was 30 seconds. I played a Christian hymn called the, the Banner of the Cross. And when I started doing variations on this hymn, he stopped me and said, you're the guy I'm looking for. I don't need to hear anymore. I said, well, let me play. I haven't done anything. No, 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 no. You're the guy. I don't need to hear him." Wow. So Donna, in 30 seconds, Yanni realized in me what the industry had not realized in seven and a half years that I was here. And Donna, being with Yanni, changed everything. Mm. It did huge projects. And they're still on. I know that, I mean, there's one called Tribute that we did at the Taj Mahal in India and at the Forbidden City in China. And the Editing is so beyond brilliant that it, one of the songs we start in the Taj Mahal and in the middle of the songs, we end up in the Forbidden City in, in Beijing, which was, by the way, the first time a foreigner, a Westerner is allowed to do a concert there. This is 97. That changed my life because we did stuff in 95, live at the Royal Albert Hall and everything. But the thing is, by virtue of this, it was so strong. Again, I'm using a lot of this word, but it's the truth. Yanni is such an incredible genius that his vision back then was so strong. And he used his incredibly talented people in a way, very similar to what Hans does. These geniuses, they know how to get the best out of you that you don't even know that you have on you, which is amazing. They have this, this, this incredible sense of higher consciousness thing, you, you, you know? Um, and I'm playing Bansuri at the freaking Taj Mahal. I'm playing Chinese flute made out of black jade in the in city of Beijing. And people freaked out. They go, and I'm playing Duduk. And they put this giant thing of the Taj Mahal behind me. And they made a close-up because I'm playing this gorgeous intro that, that Yanni came up with. And I remember my daughter saw this. You know, this tear came out and they got us, they got a, a, a close up in that. And people in the industry freaked out. Who's that brown guy playing all those things? You know, like the John Blow uh, joke, you know, <laughs> who's John Blow? Gave me John Blow like that. Yeah. Who's that guy? We need that guy. That was my ticket to get into the studios from there on. Wow. How long were you with Yanni? 11 years without counting the, the years that he stopped. So I literally started in 95 and until 2006. 
and I'm incredibly, eternally, undescribably thankful to him. Yeah. And I bless him with every blessing. Listen, talking about saxophone, he has to do with this as well because I was, I gave up playing sax, you know, and he said, hmm, I heard that um, two very heavy things I'm going to tell you about him, this super genius guy. I heard you play saxophone before. I like the old ball. So go get a soprano and practice, you know, uh, rent a soprano practice a week. And then you come play for me. I, I want to see. So I did, you know, practice. It came from, mm, I like what I hear from you. Go buy a soprano and practice because I want to use it in the show. <laughs> so I did. I went, bought, bought the soprano and, and uh, I had the top-notch Yamaha back then at the time, which is the same thing Wayne Shorter was playing, the 85, yes, 85 Pro, you know, back then. Talking about, you know, uh, 90s, mid-90s. And I practiced, with, and then when I came to say, okay, Yanni, uh, this is like, and the plan was almost like four, four grand, something like that, 38, something, whatever. Say, I, I need you to start discounting this. Like, no, 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 that's a gift. I'm not going to do anything with that, so... And that's the second thing he gave me. He gifted me with. He gave me a bass flute before Yamaha. The bass flute that I have to this day. And I'm like, oh, this guy is something else, you know. And so he got me playing the sax again, seriously. But he said, "Listen, your duduk, your sax, and everything. You need to bring that to a level that is so strong that people do not know that you are a flute player specialist. I don't want people to know what is your specialty. I don't need say, but you're you're crazy. That's impossible. No, I'm sorry. I'm the boss. That's what I need. Donna, he forced me to a place where now, if I don't tell people, even though I'm not as active, because we go through phases, you know, playing the saxes now, when I pick them up, <laughs> I become a sax player. I'm not a flute player doubling in saxophone. You, you know what I mean? My mind, my everything. If people check out Largo Winch, which is a series, not the last version because that was done by uh, Alexandre Desplat, but the one we did before with super genius Michel Colombier, they, they can hear some serious soprano sax things I did there. And um, I realized, like, oh my gosh, it's 20 something years ago and I'm playing like that. It's like, Whoa. And he knew how to use me. That's the thing. People like that, like Yanni, like Maestro Michel Colombier, who was maybe one of the greatest musicians I ever worked with in my life. Uh, uh, composer, genius, film music composer, and just straight composer. Um, and so by virtue of this, Yanni not knowing that that is not possible, he forced me to search for the impossible, and I benefited from that. So can you can you expand upon this in, in two ways? Number one, this wasn't the first time you played saxophone, right? So, you know, we want to get into in a minute, you know, like when, you know, what that was like, but how you were able to bring it to a whole other level. Oh, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, he, wanted that, he wanted that from you, but how did you do it? Great question. Great question. I played the saxophone many years at CalArts as well, before the Yanni thing, and I sucked. It was not good. I know that people that heard me play saxophone back then, but it was not too bad because I remember then it got to a point in which I could solve for great maestro Justo Almario when uh, we had to go to Peru play with Alex Acuna and then they both co-lead, co-lead it called Tolu. I had to solve for Justico and I was playing giant steps and everything. So I was not too completely 100% useless, you know, on that. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I remember that Paul Novros at CalArts, I was playing, I remember I had a Dukov, and I was playing a wonderful horn, but it seemed to have a little thing, or it was in my mind. It was a, a Mark VI that I brought in Venezuela. Uh, silver, plate, original silver plated, mm. London model with a high F sharp, oh. amazing horn, right? But it seemed to have something that I always struggle a little bit with. But, and I had a Dukov back then. And Paul Nova said, hmm. He gave me an Autolink Metal 10 star. Ten? Oh my gosh. And I'm going like, <laughs> he did something genius. Donna, so genius that I told my wife this morning, I just remembered that I'm applying that 
technique, that tactic, into a duduk that I modified the holes because I had to do something for Dune 2 that has asked me to do, that I had to modify my duduk and open new holes and close holes and do everything in order to play the melody he asked me to. And I'm applying that technique that Paul Novros used to help me jump into something that strong into what I'm doing now to accustom my fingers to the new positions with this extended lower uh, uh, thing, which is genius from Paul Novros. It's this. He said, and I'm in his house. This is private. This. Play the horn. And I'm like, <laughs> I could barely play. Stop, stop. You're passing out. So relax for 10 minutes. And we talk, have a little coffee, whatever. Play again. And he did that so many times until I made me get accustomed to the all link 10 star. And that's home for me. That's what I've been playing for 30 years. Whoa. And of course, I have other things, uh, Lamberson and, and whatnot, but that auto link that's home for me, you know, and I use Leger, uh, two, two and a half threes and that. And uh, I, I feel home with that, really, because I got accustomed to that. So that's what I'm doing now with this positions thing that, you know, I, I, I do the practicing until it hurts a little bit, then I stop and I do my, my thing, I recover, then I do a little bit more. And that way, I will get to a place in which I get accustomed. That's what happened here. And I admire some, and that's one of the things I wanted to mention. I was sick beyond description. Of course, I was into Bird, who I discovered in France. I had the Omni book and all those things. And then Coltrane, of course, who, who is not influenced by him. And, and, and of course, Wayne Shorter, because I got into jazz through Weather Report as well. So when I met, I met Alex Acuna, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm playing with the legend and I'm in his band, you, you know. But I remember that Brecker just killed me, Donna. Michael Brecker, like, oh. and I was in Calarts. I can try to find words. In Spanish, we say, me hacía daño. It's not that he hurt me, but it was painful to listen to him because he was so good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It is like, I'm never going to be able to play like that. Of course, idiot, stupid me. Why should I play like that? I'm me. You know, and many people helped me afterwards. But it is this thing that when I was playing the flute, I wanted to become my teachers. Then, and that included also, who was not my teacher, but a huge influence, James Galway. When I was studying Indian music at Cal Arts, Bansuri, I wanted to become Hari Prasad Chaurasia, you know, the greatest flautist in Indian music, who became my, he became my teacher later. When I'm playing the saxophone, I wanted to become trained, and then I wanted to become Michael Brecker. And I had, you know, many of his licks and everything, but curiously enough, look how I'm jumping from one thing to another. I wanted to thank you and congratulate you and bless you, Donna, because of things you've done to this thing. You've blessed me without knowing. I got the Michael Brecker uh, notebook thing. <laughs> oh, because you, 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 I did the podcast with David Dempsey. Yeah. Yes. Good, good, good. <laughs> that blessed me so bad. Okay. I, went, I went through half of it and I had to... <laughs> order to say <laughs> and i got it the next day but then i was so impacted by that post podcast thank you donna that was awesome. that was genius that was genius that uh, amazing 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 god bless you guys and god bless dave and god bless michael of course and and and, and uh yeah ma amazing and his wife and everything that allowed to do th the thing for me it's so incredibly powerful, Donna, how we go through phases in, in life, you know. Now, I'm in a different place. I can listen to Michael, and I'm incredibly impressed by the sheer level of us uncanny, borderline human possible thing that is impossible, you know. Yet, while recognizing that, many times I would gravitate more towards Wayne Shorter because of where I am musically now at, don't I? 
after studying musical phenomenology, and I'm studying, I will study for my whole life, which is, I don't want to impress anybody. I don't want to feel like I'm playing to be a intellectual lloyd, no, none of that stuff. I'm not into that. I'm a, I'm a pragmatist, pragmatist. Uh, simply to, to explain this. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, by the way, why I returned to classical music is because then, as I said before, this thing was covered. And creativity was covered because I got a, a master's from jazz and I had to do Indian music where you create. Then I took the things and applied it to classical music. Don't it now, even when I'm in a concert, in a recital, which I did a few months ago back in, 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 in Texas at a university, uh, uh, one of the Baylor, uh, UA, UA, UHMB or UM, yeah, UMHB, University of Mary Harding, Baylor. Texas, I did a whole week there as a visiting artist, and I played several concerts, and one of them was a recital. And in the recital, Donna, <clears throat> I asked people randomly from the audience, give me three notes. You give me a note. They said, A. They say, F sharp. You give me a note. They gave me a C. Imagine, F sharp, C. You give me a note, A. A. So from those three notes in a public recital, I made a musical moment out of that. And it's on tape. It was so you, I you solo? You solo? Yes, I made a whole piece out of this in front of that. So at the end, I told them, you need to applaud yourself because you guys were co-authors. You gave me the notes where these things came from. <laughs> Why I'm mentioning that is because analyzing Mozart for so many years, I made my own book, unpublished yet, on how to compose our own cadences in the Mozart style. Because mm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a void in classical music. And I'm dealing with creativity, so I went, to Mozart, yeah, you know, who? Why do? Why did I go to Mozart and not Bach? Because Mozart gave me the illusion of accessibility. Oh, okay, okay. It makes me think that it's accessible. Of course, when I start analyzing him, <laughs> but when he hears his music, you listen to his music, you're like, oh yeah, it makes so much sense. But that's greatness, right? Anyways, I studied him deeply for many years by virtue of that, and studied later musical phenomena musical phenomenology, which is the discipline that searches to objectivize the laws that rule how sound can affect our consciousness and hopefully affect it into transcendence. So it is a science. It's a powerful thing. And when I got into this, my whole perspective towards music exploded. Now I can listen to Mozart again because now I know where the climax and the whole flute concerti are and the musical reason why. If I tell people to sing me happy birthday the most musical way possible, 90% of them think about the technicality of the music, which is time to be in tune, but they don't deal with what is called the dynamic structure, which is called literally the energetic musical topography inside happy birthday and where the climax is okay hold on i gotta stop you for a second because this is okay this is interesting because at queen's college i took a course with carl schachter who was the world um authority on shankirian analysis and shankirian analysis you know what i'm talking about right so yeah yes yeah, so analysis is is a sense like a the big picture of like if you have a you know a symphony you know, what's the big one? What's the big 5-7? And the 5-7 right. in Western music is the chord of tension. And where's the final release? So this right. is what this reminds me of. Well, it, they're related. Okay. They're not the same, but they're very, very much related. And you touched something incredibly important. Nowadays, we live times where our perceptions are fragmented. Mm. And that has become the norm. Yeah. We don't pursue what could bring transcendence to our spirits, to our consciousness, which is when we get to a place where this material thing disappears and we're in a different place. I'm talking about reality, but I'm not talking about BS, okay? Which is when I hear Coltrane play, you know, I got goosebumps now telling you this. When I hear certain things of Wayne Shorter, when I hear certain things of Zawin, when I hear certain things of Miles, I go to another place. I know to another place. You know, I, when I play with Hans and we're in tour, I, I go to another place. I, I experience transcendence. It's very hard to do that when you're bombarded by information every other second. And you're not allowed to experience unity 
which in philosophy is called a monad, which is the contrary of a dichotomy or a multiplicity, which is we need in music, this is heavy stuff, but important stuff, which is an art form that exists over time, physically, that starts here and ends off here later. We need to experience that as a unity. Donna, what is your second name? You have a second name. A, a second name, is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's only Donna? Yeah. Oh, Marie okay. is my middle name. Okay, Donna Marie. When you got in trouble and you were little, okay, yes. and your mama called you Donna <laughs> Patsy. <laughs> my second name is Jose. My mama called me, called me Poopy, Poopy. But when she said Pedro Jose, I was running because I know I was in trouble. It's like, right? It's a Donna Marie. Oh. And with the, Italian, the Italian, I'm half Italian, so you got to watch out. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Why I'm using this example? It's very heavy. Because people tell me, listen, how can you experience as a one thing, as a unitary experience, something that starts and moves and ends? How don't experience it you? When we were called by our parents, by our full name, we did not process, you did not process D O N N A. That's right. Space M A. No, you didn't process individual syllables. Do, na, ma, no. When you heard done, you were running because you knew that the Marie, the end, was already containing the donut that was beginning, and the whole thing, you received it as a unity. That's what I want to do in music in order to experience transcendence. Okay, let me try to process this for a second because I thought you were referring to, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, we have, you know, individuals creating music and all that kind of thing. And music is not, it's not an individual, individualistic thing, individualistic thing. It's, we create it, even if you're playing solo works, it's still part of a whole. But I was thinking like, you have people with all different approaches and styles. And as in one big piece of music, you have you have tension and release and you have conflict. Correct. Correct. And, okay. Correct. Conflict and but, 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 conflict. This is universal. What you just mentioned, that is the culprit of the whole thing. You did on. The most universal fundamental dynamic there is is tension and release. The problem we have now is that people are putting where tension goes, release elements, and the opposite. It's not going to work. You cannot be pregnant and not pregnant at the same time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You cannot not speed up if you are over 65 in California. You are. We are. We basically up. Oh, that's it. There are realities that are like that. Of course, I'm, I'm being a little bit extreme here. What I'm talking about is about searching the highest possible expression that will allow me and usher those listening to me into an experience of transcendence. All the wise for me, Donna. It is not music, it's beautiful sounds or sounds that can affect me at many levels, even make me laugh or make me cry. For me, what I'm talking about is higher than emotions or make me move my booty. No, and that's, for me, that's what music is. I have the arrogance, many would say, that I can define what music is. Music is transcending through sound. That is what music is to me. Mm. And that's what I search when I play Duduk. It's universal because you said it. The principle of tension and release is exactly the same everywhere, even in atonal music, where we don't have a, a dominant seventh. That is our obvious tension thing. And by the way, Donna, I don't know if you know this, but I've done my own research, and I believe God has blessed me on that. Have you ever heard anybody explain why the dominant seventh is tension? Why? Hmm. I'm trying to remember. Si fa, do, mi, sol, mi, do, do, si, la, sol, si, re, fa, si, fa, si, fa, tension, si, fa, si, fa, b, f, e, f. Hi, Tony. Uh, but why that is? Maybe we need to have another conversation another time, and I'll explain to you about my researches and that. I got into the harmonics series, and I put those notes in the harmonics series. And what you hear of those two notes, BF, BF is such a turmoil. <laughs> that when you solve them, 
front goes from somewhere. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we're probably listening at a molecular level of what's going on with the harmonics because we know that that is attention. Even the rock and rollers, rock and rollers, no, 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 the same thing in the in the Somo Duno. Bamida Panka Kongamina Anga Panga Four Five Dila Egita Gene Kongrum Bayoke Lapka Semita Basando Kong Bede Ponki Kongi the Pumpy Res Tension Tenchonga and Yunga Kogam. And we have the same two five ones in jazz. Yeah. We need to on the two and the five. Uh, Exactly the same thing. You cannot put in a good musical way over the two five already the tonic. The tonic if we're major with major seven uh, on it. And then on the major seven, play. The two five notes. That is what is happening now in music. And that is what is happening now in many of the classical music worlds and the expressions. That sense of conducting tension release, tension release, that's a that's the topography that I mentioned before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have discovered through these studies with the great master of musical phenomenology is uh Maestro uh, Sergio Celibidake, who's a conductor, a Romanian guy, uh, uh, super genius that uh, for many years was doing uh, Berlin and then uh, he was let go and then he went Munich, this thing. But his thing was that musical phenomenology. And I studied with two of his disciples, Maestro Mark and Thakar, and with Maestro Cristina uh, Cosel. And uh, Maestro Thakar is in Baltimore, Maestro Cristina is in, in Vienna. Now, she was in, in San Jose near us. Anyways, I'm talking too much. The point is, everything we do, a traditional Duduk solo piece, my Venezuelan traditional pieces, the changes. You see, it, in, in, in the standards, you have AABA. You know, it's a very Mozartian thing. Yeah. You yeah. say something, you reestablish it. You contrast it with something, and then you come back home again. There's a curve. Yeah, yeah. You, you see? And then, this is very heavy to what I'm going to share now real quick. Um, Donna, please allow me. I know this is a long interview, but please allow me to do the saxophone things later. It's, it's important. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the mouthpiece and, and the things. It's, 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 you asked me how I went from the flute to that. but And maybe we can talk about these things later. But uh, there are principles of, I'm very deep into this which is more than playing the instrument, is to make music now. I tell the people, I don't have much time, unfortunately, to, to teach. But when I do, I, I tell them, I invite you to reconsider your whole endeavor. Instead of thinking you are a flautist or you're a saxophonist, think, I think of myself as a, as a musician that happens to play an instrument. The culprit should be to make music. And and that's why, Donna, this might be very controversial. My love for Michael Becker will never diminish. He's untouchable. I mean, it's you, you know what I'm talking about. It's like <laughs> <laughs> yet as a time now, my admiration for Wayne Shorter. Why? Because I hear many times, and I can see it through the notebooks, that Breaker practiced a lot, many things that then came out. I don't think there is a notebook for Wayne Shorter's vocabulary. Mm. And the reason is very strong. I, I started him. He went four years with Art Blakey, playing Bob at the highest. If people check out Wayne Shorter playing with Art Blakey, they're going to they're, they're, they're going to freak out. Not many people talk about that. I, I have dug into that. Well, to my knowledge, maybe they have, and I do know about that. Because that, that's very uh, pretentious to, to say nobody's talking about it from, obviously, from what I know. 
maybe many people haven't. I'm not I'm not aware, I'm ignorant of that. But then all the years he spent with Miles. Holy moly. And many of the big hits that Miles had were when shorter students. Mm. Oh yeah, big time, big time. And 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 Wayne Shorter would say, he said, Miles Allen, Wayne, bring the book. <laughs> you know? And then when he did Art Blake, then he did Miles, who took the thing. People don't remember many times. Well, maybe they do. I should not speak like that. That's stupid talking. It comes to my mind to remember that. They would say, you know, Herbie and, 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 and Wayne would say, Miles would tell them, I don't want you to practice at home. I pay you to practice in front of people. That level of freshness and openness Miles required of Wayne, of Herbie, of Tony Williams, of Ron Carter. And after Wayne did that, then we saw it all completely another <laughs> thing yeah that blows me away i can hear a guy and, and donna this is very heavy very heavy maybe you're the first one in an interview i'm saying this to so this is a first for you i'm very heavy in a quest now my artistic thing my creativity thing more than working in that, that i do i have to you know is I'm in a question how to develop the unknown. How to practice, how to study in a way that I'm equipped to, in the moment, Frank Zappa said this as well. When they asked him if he was, you see how I jumped from one thing to another? That's okay. And I, and I forgot to mention as well that studying with great Ravi Shankar, who's one of my teachers as well, I realized he was into the stuff like Charlie Parker was or, or Miles or Mozart. That level of creativity he exuded when I saw him play. It's the same procedure. It's the same foundation because there are these geniuses that speak about this thing at this level that connect with us, which is completely universal. It's not styles. Is music that trickles to us through different genres. And when I hear something like that, I wanted to be able to practice something that will not make my muscle memory be imposed on what I hear. Frank Zampa said that his playing was complete and it's incredible, is what Wayne Shorter would say. He's playing the guitar because they asked him an interview, and this is available on, on Instagram, whatever. He says, are, are you a, a, a guitar soloist? How do you see yourself? He says, well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a specialist in something. Other people practice, and they play flawlessly, and they're perfect. My thing is different, he said. I have, how did he put it? He said, this is, this is so powerful, Donna. He said, I have a fairly good technical knowledge on the mechanics of my instrument, and I have... I said time that I need to improvise and I have an incredibly creative uh, supporting band behind me. So based on this, whatever comes to my musical mind, I need to make something that I believe will stand as valid, musically speaking. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he says, and if I have like I do, uh, a supporting band that can be musical and they can respond and they can provoke things that never, ever anyone could have imagined can happen. And it's the first but, time that it happens and it may not ever happen again because it's, it's happening in the moment. Right. I want to escape from playing things that I learned and regurgitate them. I need in another person that inspired me to that is this genius Guthrie Govan, maybe the greatest guitar player in the world. I play next to him with hands when we tour. And this guy's from Mars. 
he is one of the ones that I've played with that in all the exuberance of all the things I do and people give me big compliments and this and that, I still, I need so much to learn and to, and to grow. And listening to him play has inspired me and challenged me and blessed me to be able to search and, and exercise that. And that's a way shorter thing. You know what? I, I was taking- Am I making sense? Am I making sense? No, you are. And, and it's funny, you're making sense to me. And this, this is so exciting to me. But one of the things that I wrote down, one of the themes that I'm seeing is a bunch of themes. Number one, you know, just the, the what your brother did for you hmm. was give you the gift of, of that childlike curiosity and wanting to explore and explore all types of musics and all types of instruments and all that kind of thing. And going and, and, and having Jesus in your life, giving you the spirit and giving you the, the, um, the ability to feel things at a different level, but getting the ego out of the way to tap into transcendence transcendence. That's what I wrote down because the thing is that you went through that period where you told me people would bring, you know, musical scores to a concert and, and check every note. And I could, I, I totally can relate to that because, you know, I'm yeah. classically trained. I know what that's, that is. And that's, that's yeah. horrible. That's not music. That's, that's, Correct. that's judgment. Correct. That's judgment. But it's anti music. Correct. Anti music. But the thing is that you were able to get past that, you know, performance anxiety, you know, because you realize that's it, it essentially it's an ego thing. It's an ego thing. We're here to service the music, right? right. And the right. whole idea with music is, transcendence correct idea when you're playing for an audience it's not about you it's no. about your job is to get the audience to feel something for me that's even secondary for me it's to go vertical i play for an audience of one they happen to to witness my delivery in gratitude because i'm alive and he gave sense and direction to my life and donna that is so freaking impacting because i see the result in that one thing i want to clarify ego is good what we're talking about is an excess of or, or a displaced ego because ego is self-respect. Sure, sure. Now, I wanted to clarify that. No, but no, no, ego, no. ego that becomes, uh, uh, the, uh, what's, what's the description of, in, the, in the Greek thing? Uh, narcissistic. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, screw that. I, I have no time for that. Listen, I always say that God made me a musician to keep me humble. <laughs> Because in any second that I think anything of myself, music will kick my booty so bad and put me in my place 